Welcome to Storage Developer Conference 2020, the virtual event. I'm Rochelle Alvers, the chair of the SNEA Scalable Storage Management Technical Workgroup that develops the SNEA Swordfish specification. This presentation is an overview of Swordfish and a little bit of a deep dive into some of the various pieces and uh, into what Swordfish looks like, how it's constructed, uh, and a little bit uh, of a, a start into some elements you might need to start implementing. First, a disclaimer. <laughs> of course, the information in this presentation rep does represent a work in progress and is subject to change without notice. This URL, however, is very important, snea.org slash swordfish. For You'll hear this several times throughout the storage management track presentations at this event. Um, this URL is where you can go to find all of the information in one spot about Swordfish. I will repeat it a couple more times even in this presentation for you. All right, so what are we gonna cover today? This presentation, um, again, is talking about a SNEA Swordfish. Um, so what is Swordfish? Swordfish is a new specification for managing uh, st storage in a standardized way. It's an extension of the DMTF Redfish spec. We'll talk about what that means. Um, it's designed to manage storage equipment and services, not just for enterprise data centers, but for all environments, converged, hyper-converged, hyperscale, cloud, direct attach, you name it. It's really designed to cover all of those spaces. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about how it does that. Um, and we'll also talk about how it partners with Redfish to cover both server storage and fabric seamlessly. Um, We'll, we'll dig into basically all of those things as well as talking um, about how Swordfish is constructed, what functionality it covers, uh, and a little bit more. All right, so how did we, one of the things we wanted to get through in, in terms of talking about um, what Swordfish is, is why did we build it this way? So the first thing we start with is our approach for building Swordfish. Um, one of the things that's very important is that this is a client-centric approach to building a standard. Uh, we did not do what many standards have done and build a vendor-centric uh, vendor approach, which is to basically take every possible function and put it in. What we did was instead use a client-centric approach, define use cases, and really focus the standard on functionality that maps to functionality that only the clients need um, and, and specifically only includes those use cases. Um, it covers, of course, block file and placeholders for object. Um, and as I've already mentioned, it covers um, not just traditional storage domains, the direct attach and the uh, enterprise, but we've extended this to be flexible to cover converged environments, um, hyper-converged, all of those, as well as by extending Redfish and having a single protocol and um, instrumentation mechanism, it seamlessly covers servers, storage, and fabrics together. And this is you know, network fabrics as well as storage fabric management. One of the other things we've added into this infrastructure is the option for implementation to uh, utilize CLASP service. Um, and we'll talk with more about what that looks like as well, but we provided this as a, as a value added option built directly into the standard. Um, so uh, implementations have the option to add that, um, that interface as well. As, as noted a couple of times already, Swordfish is an extension of the Redfish API. We did not build a whole new standard from scratch. We leveraged the entire protocol stack from Redfish, which does server management, network management. We cover the storage pieces. This has a few additional benefits, one of which is 
it's not a completely different standard. It's exactly the same. Someone building an, an implementation that needs to cover multiple things can build a single implementation, or they can leverage an implementation they already have. Um, clients can get the same benefits uh, if they're building for Redfish. Swordfish implementations is really just talking to different schema. They don't have to learn different protocol requirements. Um, so what is that technology? The Redfish technology is a RESTful interface um, using HTTPS and, J, um, and returning JSON payloads um, with some OData constraints and some OData, additional OData uh, uh, infrastructure as well. So who is developing this? Um, we really like to highlight this as well. This has been developed as a partnership um, between DMTF and Swordfish or and, and SNIA. Um, where you can see a lot of the companies working jointly between these two organizations. SNIA has focused exclusively on the storage extensions. Um, Redfish and DMTF focus on um, the server elements as well as the underlying protocol and definitions. Um, there's a lot of companies that you know clearly work in both spaces, but there's some companies that work exclusively on the server side, and some companies that work exclusively on the on the storage side. So oh, let's dive in and see what this actually looks like. Um, I've talked several times already about the fact that Swordfish extends to Redfish REST model. What does that look like? Let's start with what does Redfish look like. Um, Redfish, Swordfish extends the Redfish's um, storage model and, uh, from, a, from a system perspective and goes from there. So let's talk about what that basic looks like. Um, Redfish's basic higher rest hierarchy uh, goes from a fixed URI, which is the slash Redfish slash V1, um, which we call the service route. From there, you can have a set of resource collections and services. I don't have those all highlighted on here, but you'll see those in other spots and other presentations. So um, the two important ones from a server management perspective that instrument um, the bulk of a system functionality are the logical view and its physical view, the logical view being the slash systems, which is um, instrumenting a computer system, and the chassis, which implements the physical instrumentation. Um, the initial Redfish storage model, or the base Redfish storage model, covers, includes, um, you know, basic drive attach for a, a standalone server. Um, so that's been our starting point for Swordfish. What we've done is basically said, okay, those are good starting components. However, we have a lot more functionality and a lot more scalability needs. We want to extend the model, so let's use that as a good starting point rather than you know, creating something completely different. So the basic model here, volumes are in these collections. Um, collections are groups of resources um, directly off of the storage resource um, drives are basically the physical, again, that physical representation um, off of that. So there's basically volumes and drives representation, um, which works again for a small configuration, but it doesn't scale. Um, and it doesn't provide a lot of, of virtualization and abstraction functionality that you'll need as your system gets larger. So that's the Redfish view. When we start to add in, what is Swordfish? Well, the first thing we do when we go to Swordfish is we want to provide some level of aggregation to provide that scalability and that manageability. So the first thing we add is a storage pool. Some people think of these as media groups or disk groups or whatever the term we use is storage pool. So um, we move that point of aggregation there and we have, uh, uh, then we have the ability to add uh, a tremendous amount of scalability, even to a relatively small configuration, like a, a direct attached configuration. We can move to, uh, you know, large number of drives, even in a direct attached configuration, um, and, and have it much more inherently manageable because we can put drives in pools, carve volumes out of pools, and still have those um, uh, uh, easy to easy to manage. 
Um, so, you, but you can see a, a just minor changes here. Um, from a client perspective, we're still keeping some consistency. Um, we no longer just create a volume directly by mapping to the drives. We now create the drives out of the storage pools because the drives are, are now allocated to pools instead of directly to volumes, but the user can still access them off of the volumes. All right. Um, again, keep it to a relatively small configuration. If you wanted to say, what does it mean to have, you know, what is the, the small, you know, the, to start a swordfish configuration, um, we have this notion of the minimum swordfish configuration. We actually have various permutations in different ways you could actually deploy swordfish. This actually follows along growing that thing from what we call what we call the integrated configuration. I'll describe this more later. But the reason we talk, we talk about this one specifically here is that um, this follows along well where in expanding from redfish, where we have um, a storage attached to a server. Um, but there's really only, I've already talked about the storage pools, there's really only a couple of other things that we've added to the base requirements for Swordfish. And we've added those specifically to um, make things easier for clients to find Swordfish implementations. One of those is we've added the storage collection at the service route. Um, when I describe everything later, this will make a lot more sense. But um, what that does is it means that, and that's this third box down here, um, the redfish slash redfish slash v1 slash storage. This is where clients can go to find storage systems in any implementation, um, in any swordfish implementation, uh, regardless of what the, what the configuration looks like. The other thing we've added is we've added this features registry. And what the features registry does is it shows the client what functionality those storage systems can support. So we have a set of 14 potential feature, current features. We have a, currently we have a set of 14 features that each storage system can advertise support for. And so this and those would be populated into this features registry. So a client can go look and see what storage systems are there and also what features they support. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. All right. Uh, we've also talked about class of service being an optional feature. I've now mentioned features twice. Um, the way these show up is these also show up in. Um, uh, off of the service route. So if a system is also supporting storage services, you will find those off of slash redfish slash v1 slash storage services. So because clients can also go find those um, in, a, in a uniform place. So again, if the features registry says we support class of service, um, the client knows that they can go to slash redfish slash v1 slash storage services and find pointers to all of the uh, that that corresponding functionality and it will be in that single spot. So we'll talk more about um, what that looks like in a little bit. So some kind of summarizing some of the capabilities here. We've talked about the featured registry. What goes in there is supported features. There's 14 of those currently and we expect to have a, quite a few more rolling out here in a few months to support the NVMe and NVMe OF configurations. Um, but features are really high-level descriptions of functionality that an implementation can advertise that it supports. On the implementation side, profiles are how an implementation can um, verify and, and work. You, you know, that's the detailed language we've provided for the implementations, either client or, or device side to basically validate um, what that what the details of that are. Uh, <coughs> um, excuse me. So these correspond to things like discovery. And as you can see here, there's uh, provisioning, um, replication, local and remote, um, event notification, um, 
performance metric instrumentation. And we have these in multiple categories. So we have block, we have file, um, and there's a nice little hierarchy of things that depend on each other. But in, a lot, in most cases, a lot of these things are, for, are fairly autonomous. So you can, uh, implementations can, can have a, a set of functionality that they support that's relatively independent. Um, so these are the types of capabilities we support. Block has, has, a whole, has a whole set of capabilities that's integrated into the spec and is able to be advertised via profiles. Uh, and file on the file side as well. Um, files, file systems can be layered on top of block, um, depending on the implementation, or they can be advertised just file functionality and, you know, um, independently if the implementation chooses not to um, expose the underlying block capabilities. Okay. Um, so what are the primary elements in Swordfish? We've seen this a, a couple of these on the previous slides as just the kind of some of the, the base um, objects. So we've seen block, uh, volumes. Um, we've talked about storage pools. We've also seen a little bit of the media, which it drives. But uh, there's other types of media as well. It could be memory components, um, you know, persistent memory, and even NVMe, although NVMe tends to represent itself as drives. Um, or other types of devices as well. Uh, but there's different types of media. And so the media tend to be, you know, the base components, uh, you know, chunks of things, chunks of capacity in replaceable units that you put into pools. And then the pools have attributes that you can carve up into volumes. We have other elements um, that we use for uh, more complex functionality when you're dealing, largely when you're dealing with um, you know, representing and presenting storage uh, to you know, from devices shared to multiple hosts. So things like storage groups and consistency groups, they serve different purposes. Storage groups are really about sharing, um, you know, how, how you're going to, you know, map, well, mapping and masking is a terminology we use, uh, but how you're basically going to hide and present uh, function, you know, um, group volumes uh, to, sets or individual hosts. Um, and then consistency groups is basically how you group volumes in sets for, for purposes of uh, use by particular applications. That could be databases, that could be backup, um, whatever those applications are. It's the ability to say, designate volumes to be treated as a set. Um, and again, we've talked about some of those additional elements like classes of service. Class of service basically ends up with three things that you use, end up using together. You have the storage service, which encapsulates all the functionality when you're using a class of service. And then class of service that's also, that's, that is the utility that's defined by um, lines of service, which are attributes. All right, so how does Swordfish work? Let's talk about walking the model. Well, since this is a REST-based interface, one of the things you get to do is you don't actually have to understand the entire schema um, and the details of the model in order to interact with the system. Um, so as a note, one of the things we do as a work tool and as we produce to help people both conceptualize um, what systems look like for our for our own purposes developing the spec as well as a reference for people working on implementations, um, we create mockups. And mockups are just static views of systems. Um, so we publish this at um, surfishmockups.com. We have a whole different, you know, tons of different kinds of mockups published there, and we add more on a regular basis. Um, these are just represent static representations of implementations. Um, they're not necessarily normative, although they are, you know, fairly consistent with the schema at this point. Um, so, one again, since these are REST, one of the things you can do is instead of like digging your way through the spec and through the schema, um, especially if it, for you know true end user clients, you can actually just 
point yourself at a system and navigate your way around. So that's one of the things you can do by, you can learn how, what Swordfish looks like by just going to swordfishmockups.com and working your way around. So what does the Swordfish hierarchy look like? We're gonna do basically the same thing statically here. So um, looking at this particular view, this one's actually really, really busy. It's not actually, this, this is relatively atypical. This is what would be a very, very complex system. Um, and probably managing a lot of different uh, uh, devices all at once. So um, keep that in mind. But what there's lots of um, so there's a lot of different permutations and things included in this in this representation. Um, but there's so um, with that said, we'll hop right in and we'll start looking just looking around. As you can see here at this service route, we've got storage systems, storage services. Managers, tasks, uh, session services, account services. Um, there's a lot of functionality that uh, gets instrumented um, in a Redfish service to support uh, to, to support the instrumentation. So just starting to wander through the mockup, so find our way around. We navigate down through. Hey, what's this storage services thing? It looks like this system actually implements class of service. Let's go look down through here. And so you click on that, or you what you do is you basically at the first one we basically just put the equivalent of a get in in our URI in our in our web browser. So it's localhost redfish slash v1. We saw the last one. Now we put um, this URI. Um, localhost redfish v1 slower services and we get this collection and it shows us hey there's three different ones here so um we can you know if if you're if you got a plug in in your browser or a tool you can you can look some of these will let you click on it but otherwise you just put it in your browser put the up add extend the link over here and say let's go let's go look through one of these and see um you know, dig down and go look at some more details. Well, okay, so in the storage service, you can see they're actually a flat, relatively flat structure to see what's in there, but there's all of these things, right? The available classes of service, lines of service, um, the volumes that are there, the storage pools, the storage groups, endpoints that are used to, have, to for the, the groups we talked about, the storage groups and the consistency groups, uh, and, and, and more, um, you know, pointers to drives, like all, all sorts of things. Um, there's also this section called links, which instead of the things that are directly part of the storage service, these are pointers to related resources. So this links construct is used pervasively throughout the system. And these are just, you know, these, these are always just things that are related to the object you're looking at. Okay, so what about a file service? Our storage service for, you know, the same thing, storage service, um, but instead of for block, it's for file. It looks exactly the same. This is the way we constructed file as opposed to block is it literally, literally added two schemas. So in this case, the only thing you see differently is the addition of file systems and file shares are embedded within file systems if, if file shares are implemented. Um, so everything else looks the same. Okay. So let's, instead of just navigating our way around, let's actually do navigate for purpose. We want to, you know, do a specific action. So let's uh, find some capacity information. So um, let's find capacity information on a volume. Um, so what we're gonna do is if we go back to our, you know, what we talked about at first, we can go to the storage collection off the service route, find a system and, you know, find its volume and, and go down and find capacity. So that's what we're going to do. All right. So we did a get on slash redfish slash v1. Here's the data that was returned. These little dots here are just where we snipped out because they're, these things get too long. So um, the red piece is where I highlighted Ah, in this return data, which is step two, um, read the link to the storage collection. This is the URI, I found the storage collection. I know that's where the volumes are gonna be under here that I wanna go look for. So that's the URI that I wanna put in and navigate to next. 
here we go. We go pick a storage system. We went, okay, we went to that storage collection, right? Um, and so here's the, um, here's the three members of that storage collection. And um, so we go down, we find the volumes. So there's the volumes collection. Go into the volumes collection. Oh, hey, there's six of them. Let's grab the first one, this, you know, one that ends in four, five, six, seven, and do a get on it. And again, filtering out a bunch of the additional information. There's quite a lot of data that can come back about a volume. Let's go find the capacity of the information. Well, there's a bunch of potential capacity information that can come back. Sometimes it will only come back with one or two pieces of property. Sometimes it can come back with a lot of information depending on the implementation. But in this case, what we wanted to do was just look and see consumed versus allocated. How much space is left on this on this volume? So allocated tells us, you know, what it was to start with. Consumed tells us how much has been used. No, hey, this volume hasn't been used at all. There, we're done. All right. So we navigated around. We found exactly what we we're looking for and got our information. Okay. All right. So moving on. The next thing we talk about is the swordfish configurations. Um, one of the things I talked about very early on and highlighted a couple is that um, that integrated configuration where we attach, um, we, we, what we're highlighting was um, swordfish attached to a storage system was just one of many potential configurations. So there's a lot, lot of potential options for how storage can be configured. You can have external storage, you can have sh shared storage, you can have um, server attached storage, lots and lots of different configurations, um, single drives, you know, arrays with thousands and thousands of drives, uh, lots of different options. And we're trying to model all of those with a single spec. So um, what we've done here is we've actually gotten, we've modeled, um, four different configurations. Um, and the reason we've done that is because if you're just trying to go determine from looking at the schema, it can be a little bit challenging to figure out which path to use for which configuration. So we've, we've added specifically some diagrams and some guidance for folks to understand um, which configuration to use um, and, and which one is kind of recommended for which type of configuration. So we've talked a lot about this integrated storage, storage swordfish configuration. Um, use that as an example because that makes a lot of sense when you move in talking about storage that's attached to a single computer system. Um, and I'll describe that again in a minute. Uh, one of the primary, though, for a whole lot of devices is the what we call the standalone swordfish configuration. So for external storage devices, for shared storage, like fabric attached, um, this is a primary configuration. And then for the service-based configuration, these two are very similar to those two, um, except they have the addition of that storage services. Capability so that standalone service configuration is is um, very close to an extension of the standalone swordfish configuration, except adding storage services capabilities. And similarly, the hosted service configuration can extend the integrated service swordfish configuration to add storage services. It has the additional feature of being able to also be a, um, a the configuration that also can define a software-defined storage implementation very neatly. Um, I won't go into that permutation today, though. All right, so the standalone swordfish configuration. Um, we expect a lot of devices to follow this model. Um, what this does is you basically instantiate your um, logical subsystem and controllers uh, in these in slash redfish slash v1 slash storage with uh, a store an instance of storage with everything hanging off of that right so your storage controllers um, so the store sto let's see the storage object represents your subsystem itself 
um, and everything you know kind of connects to that. And then you have chassis if you want to do the physical representation. Um, many will want to do that for you know fru management and just representing physical configurations, things like that. Um, storage controllers in a traditional uh, system will represent and model your actual con your your array controllers, your device controllers. Uh, and then you have all of your other objects, again, your volumes, your storage pools, uh, your media, your, um, in this configuration, you would expect to see in more complex configurations, this picture just shows a very simple one, but in more, um, more complex configurations, you would see consistency groups and endpoint groups and uh, storage groups um, and potentially connections to fabrics and other things. Um, to uh, you know, show represent a, a much more complex configuration. Um, so a few few notes here. One is this bottom one, which we will repeat. We I st I've said this before, but we will repeat it through this entire section. Clients can always find the stored fish storage instances in Redfish V1 storage. I said this early on in one of the diagrams, but this section highlights why this is important. Because we have so many possible permutations for how things can be connected, um, the ability to find, always have the uh, devices of you know find the storage instances in this location is very critical. So in this case, it's just instantiated here. If we go to the next configuration, the integrated swordfish configuration which is where what we saw earlier, but we'll repeat here, which is, you know, this is a model that works for, you know, if you're, if you're like a single device attached to, um, or if you're just attaching storage to a single computer system, um, you can see the storage is now connected to a computer system as opposed to slash redfish slash V1 storage system. What you do here is you, you, you add a reference link from this storage to slash redfish slash v1 slash storage. Then the client can always find that instance. But other than that, you can see the model here stays the same. You have storage representing the logical subsystem and your volume, storage pools, and drives, media, whatever, all hang off that same thing. This configuration, you likely not going to see a lot of that additional complexity of the of the um, uh, storage groups and, and you might see consistency groups here, um, but you're not going to likely see a lot of, you know, nearly as complex a configuration. All right, we go to now the service configuration. Um, the hosted service configuration is really the same view we just saw in the integrated. You can see connected to the computer system here at the top. Um, and then the storage down. But what the, the, the difference here is really that when you're representing things in a storage service, um, the storage service is what encapsulates all of the, the logical functionality, the volume, the storage pool, the drives, the chassis and things are still connected up here. Uh, the physical representation connects to the storage system uh, or the storage, um, the logical storage system representation, but then the storage service encapsulates all of the other capabilities. This allows, um, <coughs> excuse me, a couple of things. One is um, you don't necessarily want people coming to, you, you want people coming to the, store, to the storage service um, because the class of service is taking and definitions are taking over and presenting a higher level capability for volume um, and you know, potentially even pool, but, but you know, this, this uh, capacity allocation and resource allocation uh, responsibilities. This can, this can be exceptionally automated. It can just be partially automated, but it all becomes encapsulated within the storage service. Um, one other note here is really that these, this can be a many to many relationship in a lot of instances, it'll be a one-to-one -one, um, or a one-to-many, but um, the schema does allow these things to be many-to-many. -many. All right, and then the standalone, very similarly, it's just that the storage service goes direct to a storage, which is 
which is in slash redfish slash v1 slash storage. So very similar uh, type of modification to the model. Okay, so um, one of the things, the next thing we want to look at is um, switching over to a little bit more of an implementation centric view. One of the things we've showed a lot of is I'm not necessarily diving into the schema. Um, I'm just kind of learning my way around the model without having to do that. But what if you are <laughs> wanting to, to actually develop and look at that? Well, one of the nice things about the way we've developed Redfish and Swordfish is that you actually have a bunch of options here. You can actually uh, look at the schema in four different options, uh, four different uh, formats. Uh, our original format is XML um, and CSEL. And so um, this is this is really the baseline. If there's any discrepancies from anything else, you need to go back to the XML version and look at that. We also support JSON um, and then a YAML open API format. The fourth one is supporting the uh, Redfish device enablement for PLDM uh, dictionary. So I won't really get into that one. I'll just reference that um, as uh, and and point out that that also exists as yet another format. If um, for anyone who's looking at embedded implementations, um, you know uh, this this basically works for embedded devices off of PCIe bus. Um, okay, so looking at this a little bit, um, there's we'll we'll jump into a quick compare. So what I what I've done here is I've created a an example schema because the regular schemas are all really long. Um, so this is basically a, a schema um, that has an entity type. So an entity type is basically an object, like we have volumes or drives or storage pools or those things um, would be an entity. And then I've got it's got one property. So the things that are highlighted in red here were just kind of to show how some of these annotations um, de and definitions and things carry over between the different schemas. So I have, you know, an entity type um, and this namespace um, concept is really, you'll see this kind of carry over as a, a, both a definition of the object type and its version. And then we have a couple of, an, of kind of uh, annotations specific to that version. Um, then we have um, some additional one, some additional um, descriptions, long descriptions that are standard. Uh, and we have one property. Um, it's a, a Named a type boolean. Uh, it I didn't highlight this one here, which I should have. Uh, which is it's read only, um, and then it's also got a description and long description. So handful of things to kind of look for. This is what it looks like in in the XML space. I snipped off a whole bunch of the additional schema um, includes and things off of this one. Um, so there's some copyright and some other things that you'll see in the other schema that don't show up here. Um, one of the things that you wouldn't see in this norm in this schema is that there are a bunch of inherited properties that show up uh, in the other schema. Uh, so here you can see uh, all of those things highlighted again. This is the JSON schema. Um, so I've clipped out in here properties, a bunch of inherited properties, but they still do show up over here in like the required properties. Um, uh, the JSON, this is one difference between looking at the various schemas. When you look at the JSON or the YAML schema, you will actually see all of the inherited properties for each for each object type, which you will not see in the, in the, in the XML schema. Um, so here in the JSON schema, you see again at the top, the, the, ver the type and the version um, you see the description, long description for the object type, and then you see down under properties, here's the specific property. Um, you see everything that I highlighted, the, including the read-only, which I didn't, and the Boolean, um, and then here you see those two additional annotation um, 
annotations included. For you know, just the additional formatting for the YAML, you see over here the object type and version in two different formats. We have the up here with no dots and over under schemas, and then over here with dots in the title. Um, and then the description and the Exelon description um, and then again down under properties, uh, the property, um, all of the property information including a nullable property comes across. Um, you didn't see the nullable show up in the JSON but it does show up in the YAML. And then of course those additional properties show up over here. And so that's just kind of a quick comparison of the different, you know, it's the, the different schemas. And so you kind of get your pick of which one you, if you have a preference for ones you want to work with, um, I, <clears throat> and they're available, you know, kind of in all three formats. They're also all available um, on online. We republish all of the Swordfish schema onto the same website uh, that the DMTF Redfish schema are are published on, which is uh, dmtf.org slash schemas. Um, so um, that's our content for today. Let me just point you to a few swordfish resources. Um, we have, again, ca.org slash swordfish. I told you you'd hear that again. A bunch of resources available to, for you to look at. We have the SPACs, obviously. We also have user's guide. Um, we have a bunch of tools available on GitHub, um, some open source tools. We also would point you to the Redfish GitHub, which has a whole set of additional tools. Um, we have what we call a practical guide, which is a, a pointer to a bunch of additional resources specifically for implementers and some additional documentation that was that is rolled out this year. We have an error handling guide and a new NVMe mapping guide. Uh, the mock-up site that's got a ton of different mock-ups on it. We've already talked about that. Um, there's also on our education site on uh, SNEA.org, uh, you can find pointers to a tremendous number of white papers, presentations, uh, we also have on the YouTube channel for SNEA a set of Swordfish School videos. These are all, you know, five to ten minute videos um, covering specific topics. And we are adding uh, adding more to the, of those all the time. We'd love to have you join us and participate, um, and work on implementations. And um, we're also ramping up a, a conformance program. So um, look forward to that. And we all, well, there's another presentation in the track today uh, talking about the details there. Uh, we talked about the open source tools. We have several of those. There's an emulator uh, that can help you ramp up your implementation. Um, there's also a new Swordfish PowerShell toolkit if you are working on Windows and would like an assist there. Here's some additional pointers. Um, again, snea.org slash swordfish. If you're looking for, if you're not a sort uh, a SNEA member or a member of the TWIG, you can go to swordfishforum.com and ask questions. Uh, we would like you, to, if you'd be interested in joining the TWIG, you can go to snea.org slash member um, and uh, look for information there. Thank you for listening and please take a moment to rate the session. Mm -hmm.